All right, everybody. Are we ready for our first in-person lecture in, I don't know how long, since 2019, perhaps? <laughs> Amazing. Well, welcome to the third Tulane School of Architecture lecture of our fall 2021 series, Debate, Delete, Reboot, Being Wrong in Times of Change, and our first in-person lecture of the semester. This lecture series is meant to highlight the unintended outcomes, contrarian thinking, and humility of learning something new in the course of research and or practice. Tonight's lecture is the annual Walter Wisnia Memorial Lecture. The fund was established by New Orleans architect, developer, and TUSA class of 1973 alumnus, Marcel Wisnia. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel, uh, to honor the work and legacy of his late father, Walter Wisnia. Walter was a pioneer in the architecture and real estate development field in the Gulf South region. We send great thanks to Marcel for his long lasting support of the school and this lecture series and are happy to have him here tonight for this lecture event. Tonight, we are joined by Jermaine Barnes for a lecture titled, Call Me If You Get Lost. After his presentation, Jermaine will be joined by a TUSA faculty member, Omar Ali, uh, as a respondent for a conversation. Uh, and Omar is a designer, educator, and is the inaugural Tulane School of Architecture uh, Urbanism Fellow. Omar is also the co-founder of the design research practice, Table of Co. And Ali's research explores the physical and ephemeral qualities of urban interstitial spaces, that blur the boundary between public and private space. After a discussion amongst the presenters, they will take questions from the audience. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and staff will bring around a microphone. Uh, now to introduce our main lecturer. Jermaine Barnes is the founder of the Miami-based Studio Barnes. Barnes research and design practice investigates the connection between architecture and identity. Mining architecture's social and political agency, he examines how the built environment influences Black domesticity. Currently, he is an assistant professor and director of the Community Housing Identity Lab, CHILL, is it, is that, no. <laughs> uh, at the University of Miami School of Architecture. He is the 2021 Harvard GSD Wheelwright Prize winner, Rome Prize Fellow and winner of the Architectural League Prize. His design research contributes, contributions have been published and exhibited in international institutions, including the Museum of Modern Art, Pinup Magazine, the Graham Foundation, the New York Times, Architect Magazine, Design Miami Art Basel, the Swiss Institute, Metropolis Magazine Curbed, and the National Museum of African American History, where he was identified as one of the future designers on the rise. Welcome, Jermaine. Thank you all for having me. Uh, is it okay? You guys can hear me in the back, right? I got this microphone here. It's a little odd, but we'll make it. We'll make it work. Um, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you, Marcel, for creating this amazing lecture series, um, and thank you to Tulane for inviting me here for your sort of reboot of being in person again. Um, a lot of pressure being the first person. Uh, but I will try to make this as enlightening, illuminating, and entertaining um, as possible. So uh, with that said, let's jump into the lecture, uh, which is titled, Call Me If You Get Lost. Uh, some of you will know what that means. And for those of you who may not know what it means, it's essentially me tracing my architectural history from understanding space all the way to my practice and then how I then begin to practice going forward. And so it really becomes, right, this thing doesn't work. It really becomes this search for identity. Um, and specifically it started with the search for my own architectural identity. So we start with the definition of a brio. Um, 
being in New Orleans, I'm sure this is a term that is said all the time. It is derived from West Africa. It is the keeper of stories. And the way that I perceive architecture is as a way to explain histories, to explain legacies as a storyteller. So the way that I understand architecture is as a vehicle to tell the history of other people. And so we start with, where am I? Which is really me understanding why aren't I visible in the profession that I am pursuing? So this is a map of Chicago. Um, any of you who are familiar with Chicago understands its history as a very segregated city. Uh, those numbers correspond to where I live versus where I attended elementary school and high school. So number one is where my family lived, grew up in a standard two family household, uh, loving environment. But the school that I attended was far away from where I actually lived. So I was one of those fortunate young people who someone saw potential in me and said, he needs to go to this other school, not his neighborhood school. But as a result, this meant that for nine years from kindergarten through ninth through eighth grade, I would have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning to catch a yellow school bus and then ride an hour and a half to school every day and then an hour and a half back home from school. And this transversing the city, I would see different versions of what Chicago looked like. Chicago in my neighborhood, which is more working class. If you're familiar with Chicago, that's the Chicago two flat versus moving across more densely populated areas that have more high rises into Edison Park, where my elementary school was, which is predominantly single family, uh, residential type homes and stuff. Same thing happened in high school. When I got to high school, my high school was in downtown Chicago at Walter Payton College Prep. And so I'm moving around the city at a much bigger scale, looking at these other architectural instances, wondering where is the version of that that reflects my history, reflects my interests, reflects people who look like me. I just wasn't able to find those things within the city. And then you pursue architectural education. And then I attended uh, undergrad in architecture where I learned of historic structures like St. Peter's Basilica and these things in, in ancient classical architecture. But it was always devoid of the African continent. It was always a very Eurocentric version or a very American version very rarely was I able to see underrepresented versions of architecture throughout six and a half years of my studying uh, in this country. And it's odd because if we think of the actual size of Africa as the second biggest continent in this entire globe. And so to be completely absent within most academic curricula seems sort of bizarre to me. It's like, how can we have a place that's so large, so vast, so many people, but when it's time for me to understand those legacies and how it impacts the architect environment, the built environment, you can't give me examples. You can't give me precedents. You can't even give me books to read. So in six and a half years of architecture education, I never once had a black TA, never once had a black professor, never once had a black juror even tell me how bad my project was and to draw on it. Everybody knows, right? The, the professor who comes in as a guest and then draws on the wall on the thing that you spent so many hours working on and you're like, oh my God, what are you doing? I spent so much time on this. Why are you drawing on my sheets? Right? Like I never even got that experience. So I'm continuing to work through this process and trying to understand and reconcile that my own absence within a profession that I love so much and it wasn't until I moved to Cape Town, South Africa, to get my first architecture internship, that I finally began to understand the power of architecture and the power that we have as architects to shape the built environment. And so, as I mentioned before, when you're going through these legacies and you're learning these different histories and you're going to lecture series or you're reading up and you're looking at a syllabi and an entire continent is missing, it can definitely make a person feel as though they're invisible. And it can make a person feel as though they don't belong within the profession, which is often quite difficult because if there is any profession that prepares you for the world 
in my opinion, is architecture because architecture encompasses so many different disciplines into one that you can apply it in so many different methods. And so to feel as though you're erased can definitely do something to the mental capacity of a person. And so when I got to graduate school and I was working on my thesis, um, I decided to look into sort of race and architecture. And again, if you know me, you understand that I am as forthright and honest as I possibly can be, oftentimes that gets me in trouble. So full disclosure, when I was coming up with my thesis proposal, I just wanted to do the coolest hip hop and architecture proposal ever. It's all I cared about. Like Kanye West wasn't crazy yet. I was like, this is gonna be amazing. It's gonna be the greatest thing in the world. He wasn't like trying to run for president. So I was like, this is gonna be awesome. Greatest thing in the world. And my thesis advisor told me, architecture and race have nothing to do with each other. They're completely removed. We just design things that has nothing to do with that. And at that point, the rebel in me said, challenge accepted. So for the rest of my thesis, sorry, Kanye, you gotta wait. I'm gonna spend the rest of my time proving you wrong while I'm doing my thesis. And so this newspaper, was the example of me trying to do that. So every single day I work on my proposal, at night I would write articles based off reviews that I would have about my project. So I go to a thesis review, I get comments back like not in my backyard, like that's not okay. And it would never be the review that we all wish we have when we're talking about the things that we as students are excited about. Like how many of you have worked, let's say, 48 hours starting on the project, you haven't slept, like you look like the night of the living dead, you're working on these things, and when it's time to present your work, <clears throat> your jurors don't want to talk a single thing about the parts that you're actually interested in your work. Instead, they find the one thing that they don't like, and then it's that snowball of every other juror jumping on their back and saying, you know what, I don't like it either. I don't like it either. I don't like it either. I don't like it more than you don't like it. And by the time you're done, you never get to the crux of what you were actually trying to explain with your project. And so instead, what I did was, I wrote those questions to myself. If you look at the top left hand corner, it says a conversation with the architect. That was literally me having a conversation with me about the things I wanted to discuss in my proposal. That could have also be sleep deprivation, not really sure. But by the end of the proposal, I had a full newspaper based off commentary from my faculty that informed my proposal. This is one part of a much larger sort of proposal. But in the end, when it was time for my actual thesis presentation, I handed every single juror a newspaper so that asked the propaganda attached to the proposal. And I won a thesis prize. So I was like, okay, I got it. This is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in, in how architecture tells stories. And so I had a professor who she actually just stepped down as the dean at Woodbury, where I attended for graduate school. And when I finished my presentation, she stands up. I'm not making any of this up. She stands up. There's like a tear coming down her eye. And she says to me, this is your life story. And I refute. No, it's not. I was just trying to make the professor mad. And she goes, no, seriously, like if you take a step back and look at the proposal, you put yourself into this thesis. And in her opinion, the best thesis projects are the ones are a reflection of you because you're more interested in this process. And so at that moment, I sort of understood, oh, wow, like maybe this is what I'm meant to do with an architecture. Maybe this is the way that I enjoy studying and practicing architecture. But it all came from me trying to sort of do an act of defiance um, to, a, to another faculty member. So I finished that process, and then two of my faculty uh, members at the time, Jennifer Bonner and Christian Steiner, um, they were my thesis advisors. They had applied for a competition in South Florida in a city called Opalaka. Full name, Opatisha Wakalaka. It's a seminal name. It's a place in Northwest Miami-Dade. And the competition was, how do you use architecture as an agent of change? So can you help redesign a neighborhood through interventions? And part of our proposal was that I would actually move to this neighborhood because how can we practice and how can we do work so we don't actually understand the neighborhoods upon which we're actually doing these things? 
So as opposed to staying in Los Angeles and working from afar, dropping in interventions and leaving, I made the decision to actually move across the country. And the name of that project is the Mating of Life. So you look on the map, that circle at the top, that's where Opalaka is. Everybody knows South Beach, that's that bottom right over there on the, on the island. Many people don't know the history of Opalaka. It has the largest collection of Moorish revival architecture in the Western It is a very weird place. Very weird place. It's like, I like to call it a dystopic Disneyland. Like whoever, the gentleman who created the town was enamored by Alibaba and the Philly Disney. And so he used that as inspiration to design the entire place. And within that small city, which has streets like Sinbad, Aladdin, Purvis, real names, um, is a neighborhood called the Triangle. And it gets its name for obvious reasons of the actual way that it's outlined. And what's important about the Triangle is that at one point in time, it had the highest murder rate in the entire country. Entire country. And I stupidly chose to move there. And my parents looked at me and said, why would you do that? You live in Los Angeles, why would you move into this area? And I responded to them, how can I help this neighborhood with architecture if I don't know any of the people that live there, if I don't know the context, if I don't understand the place? All of those X's you see at the corners, the city had got so intertwined with crime and violence that the local government decided it's better if we put barricades at the end of the street so that there is a vehicle chase People cannot get in and out of the neighborhood. They literally imprison their own residents. And so part of the proposal was how do you remove those barricades? How do you empower the people to be there? And so the Made in Opalaka sort of tagline was trying to understand their production, the things that people make to amplify what people already do well. How can we take the skills that everyone else already has and then empower them to do that on a much larger scale? So we walked around and we started conversations with people. Started talking to young kids in the community, talking to elders, talking to people who've been there the entire time to sort of gauge their understanding to like the true collaborative collective community process. And in the end, they told us they just wanted to park. Now as an architect, it's a bit disheartening to have these grand ideas of structures and be told we don't want any of that, we just want to park. But at that point, you have to decide do you want to remove your own ego and provide the necessary amenities or do you want to keep imposing your will? We decided to actually work with the individuals. And so on this plan, it's important to understand we only own this one parcel. That's it. This one, that one, and that one were all vacant. We only own this one. I was always taught it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. So we took over the other two parcels and made it a full park without anyone asking if it was allowed or not. So this open parcel slowly starts to materialize into this actual park where those kids I showed you before are the ones that actually pick all of the amenities that are within the park. And by the time we were done, we had a full playground, we had a full park that was built within the community with people uh, from the community. And so I always like to tell people that I'm from Chicago, I'm a true city boy. I had never seen palm trees until I moved to Los Angeles. I never understood how palm trees were actually planted. I just assumed they were like small, they were plants and rosebuds, and something and boom, palm trees. Never knew that they come already mature. And then you have to build tons and tons of scaffolds that hold them up. So that palm tree garden you saw, me, and the neighborhood drug dealers built this. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Me and them, we built them together. Because when you have conversation, you begin to let people understand this is also yours. This isn't me doing this for you. This is me doing this with you. And so we were out there like a Ford assembly line. We cut it, we hammer it, we stick it up. We cut it, we hammer it, we stick it up. And then when we finish the playground, to watch them then play with their children on the play structures that they built was so heartwarming and let me know like this is what architecture is supposed to do. Now the problem is 
Well, you do one thing, and people want more stuff. So you do the first part, and there's other amenities that are required because you're trying to, again, use architecture within these urban environments. And Opelika is a food desert. And so we walked around and we used our resource University of Miami, and we found out what are the things that people eat in the area. There were no community spaces within the state. So we found an old roofing company, redesigned and renovated it, and then we built everything with the community. So everything that's planted are things that we eat in the neighborhood. And then the building became the Arts and Recreation Center where people in the community can actually rent at a very, very low rate for baby showers, for wedding receptions, for parties, and now it becomes a true community asset. Funny story about the mural that's on the building. My good friend, Oil Lake and Jade, who is the artist who did the mural, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of practicing architects registered architect. And we all know that in certain cities, there's the rules about signage, about colors, about things we can't put on the outside of the building because it's not homogenous to the character of the neighborhood. So because Opelika is a historically designated district, we were technically not allowed to do that mural. So we had to negotiate with the planning and zoning department to give us a 30-day voucher so that we can have it up temporarily. Once we placed it up, the city council at the time realized that they loved the mural and then said, you do not have to take that down. You can leave it up in perpetuity. And for many of us that work in this profession, we understand a lot of times these rules are made because people don't have the foresight to think a bit longer as far as how does it get impacted further because it's still Moore's architecture, just a different interpretation of Moore's architecture. And so that was like my first understanding of my own legacy within architecture and working for someone else. Because one thing I didn't mention about this is after the first year in Miami, my professors dropped out of the project. So things were moving very slowly. And those of us, again, who practice architecture know architecture is not fast. Urban scale architecture is even slower. So as a result, my collaborators were a bit disenfranchised with the client who has his own issue. And so I had to make the decision, do I stay or do I leave? But because I'm the one that actually moved there, I decided it's better if I stay. And so once I stayed, it's actually when the park and those other things started to happen. So it serendipitously worked out for me that I was the steward of all of those projects on my own, even though I started collaboratively with my professors. It was one of those timing, those timing things. And so when that finished, I had to decide, how do I want to continue to practice? Do I want to continue the, the, the sort of cycle of not being present within academia and only stay within actual practice? Or do I want to find a way to bridge those two worlds and understand what my research is actually rooted in? So at that point, I decided to be a faculty member full-time. And I began my research trajectory. And the first thing that I ever proposed was to the Graham Foundation, and it was called Sacred Students. Porch culture is huge in New Orleans. Porch culture is huge in the South. My family is from the South. My father's family is from Mississippi. My mother's family is from Arkansas. I am born and bred in Chicago. I'm a city as it gets. But those rituals and those cultural aspects were brought with my family up north as they migrated with many other people who identify as Black. And so you begin to see the network of how individuals left during the Great Migration. Of, and this is the second Great Migration, not to be confused with the first Great Migration, which happens in the early 1910s and 20s. This is more 30s and 60s, um, moving from the South all the way to the North and sort of identifying the trajectory of movement and the movement of architecture. And so with that Grand Foundation grant, I was allowed to then go visit five cities. So this on the bottom right-hand corner, Houston, Atlanta, Detroit, Chicago, and DC. The only reason why I did not put New Orleans on here because I've been to New Orleans so many times, I just wanted to go to new cities. And sort of understand what does that spatial volume mean in these various locations and how do those rituals also transfer with those locations? 
And so I have to go back to the beginning. Like, where does the porch come from? Where does this appendage live? And I started back in Africa, West Africa specifically, traced that through Haiti, all the way up to the South in New Orleans. And then got there to understand the importance of the shotgun home and how that's something that's distinctly uh, a remnant of this sort of migration from the transatlantic slave trade. And so I began walking around through archives, looking at historic porch images to understand the porch as a typology in Detroit, in DC, in Chicago, and then across the entire country. And so once I finished that, I decided to turn it into actual installation. How do I change those moments into something that other people can occupy? And so the first example, I had to actually deconstruct the porch, figure out what are the components that constitute that space. And many of the students here now probably don't do this exercise, but when I was in architecture school, we had to do the nine square exercise. And so that nine square exercise became the impetus for this installation in that how do I take this kit apart and then turn this into some sort of facsimile of an actual architectural porch. And so what I did was is I went around to various black neighborhoods in South Florida and I asked people on their front porch, can I borrow your chair? Because one of the most important things of the porch is the porch chair. And so this allowed me to bring those individuals from those neighborhoods into the installation themselves in Brooklyn City Center. Now you may ask what's up with the medicine balls inside of the actual scaffold. In my family, you don't sit on the nice furniture in the living room. The nice furniture is clad in plastic and is not to be set on. That's the furniture that shows how hard you work. That's the furniture that's passed down from generation to generation. That's the furniture that shows art and culture, but you can't sit on it. You wrap it in plastic instead. And since I couldn't wrap actual couches inside of this, we wrapped the medicine balls instead to sort of reference that legacy of upward economic mobility. And it worked as a social experiment. Like it was the most occupied space throughout that entire location of being able to have this porch as a way to understand other people in certain areas. And so then I was asked to do the exhibition design for a neighborhood in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And so I took that shotgun proportion and I wanted to see if I can redistribute it within this, this gallery space as a way to generate rooms that would then house this exhibition on Cistron. And so within that, there was an alleyway, there were walls, there were a front porch, there were cloths swaying, there were seating areas all within this larger framework. There was the history of this neighborhood where people who are from there saw themselves. And from that came these seating elements. And the seating elements are based off of the historic Bahamian carnival that happens in South Florida because Miami is a very culturally rich place where many individuals come from central uh, Central America come from the Caribbean and they were influxed into this area. And so this ornament was important to understand in these chairs. And so again, taking that identity of the chair, of the porch chair, clad in the ornament, which also has ties to the African hair pit. And then getting hand woven stitching seats, which then also have a legacy tied back to the hair that is so important in these cultures where oftentimes hair is policed or dreadlocks or colored hair, and these things are outlawed in sort of public sphere and public spaces. And so there's six of them that all constitute the entire series and they act as thrones within the starter's location. And then once I finished this sort of process, um, I decided to write a bit. And so this next portion is about uh, editorial, um, my editorial debut with Mass Context where me and a partner of mine named Shaheen Yubari from UC Colorado uh, would have conversations. So how many of you have been to an ACSA conference? Students, you probably wouldn't have been to this, but 
ACSA conference is something where faculty go to talk about faculty. And while you're there, you learn these various understandings of other institutions. And it's really just a way to network and meet other people with similar interests. So while I was there, I met this gentleman and we started having monthly conversations about architecture. And this is at the time where there were tons of these racialized incidents like the Keith Bob Kelly and uh, like the barbecue Betty who's like running around policing space and such. And so one day on a call, I say to him just offhand, why does everybody want to be Batman? Like, why does everybody want to be a superhero and sort of save these spaces? And he so affectionately said, it's like everybody wants to be a vigilante. And so from there, we sort of coined this term of vigilantism where we're just... So while that's getting fixed, I was going to talk to you about the vigilantism proposal. So the idea was to put together 14 other individuals who are all practicing um, across the country to talk about space from the lens of both celebratory vigilantism and sort of discriminatory vigilantism. And what I mean by that is there are always these characters that were present within these, these interactions. And we sort of coined them as the resistor, the um, aggressor, and the witness. And the aggressor is one who utilizes sort of social standing to interrupt uh, sort of action and, and inventions. And then the resistor is one who utilizes their body. Wasn't expecting all of this. Um, and so utilizing sort of their, their bodies to then resist these moments. And then what I find the most interesting is the witness. And the witness is one who appears neutral. And as that person appears neutral, the moment they hold a cell phone in their hand or they begin to take a note, they lose that sense of neutrality. And then they began to impart some sort of influence over the act. And so what you find is there's some sort of architectural logic that's either present or not present that then explains these moments. And within those moments, it's both positive and negative. So one excerpt talks from the perspective of the rural studio, uh, Sam Mockney at Auburn, and how he would do work in rural Alabama, and in rural Alabama, he would essentially remove all rural guidelines that typically govern this area and say, I want to be real with architecture. I'm going to circumvent these systems to then implement amazing infrastructure. That's an example of celebratory vigilance. Separately, you may have someone that may do the opposite, like in Atlanta with Ahmaud Arbery, where a gentleman running unfortunately lost his life because he's in a neighborhood that he apparently was not supposed to be. And so when you're juxtaposing these two things against each other, you begin to unravel a certain formal language that begins to happen architecturally, that then comes up to this larger term that we have a vigilante. Are we good? Not good? Mm, working on it. Okay. I'm seeing it from the, the IDML file. Got it. It's, it's sort of weird to do this without being able to point at the thing. That's what, that's what it shows it. Um, but it was super, hold on, I think I might be able to get you. Cool, so that's actually it, right? So understanding vigilantism as a moment. And so from there, let me throw away all this thing. Right, so we took certain stories and within those stories, again, trying to contextualize these racialized interactions. And so one of the things that we did with the graphics of the text was interrupting the actual white space in the text with these black bodies. And so the actual articles themselves became a reference point for this same understanding. And so in this issue, uh, in this essay, Emmanuel M. Masu discusses the compound as he's someone from Adidas Ababa um, through Atlanta 
is trying to understand sort of the transatlantic history of these two locations and how we look at architectural barriers of things that remove people, harm people, don't help people. And then there's all of these, not sure if that's but there's these different indexing of, of proposals, such as Joseph and Zach, where they're looking at celebratory means of architecture. And so I'll show you an image from here, and then I'll sort of wrap this up since this thing is sort of acting bizarre. Um, so mine and Shaheen's, which I mean, you have been to Yale or have seen Yale campus. This is their studio building. So within this, we're trying to understand the, the, the ways that the institution itself can sort of engender these in interactions, can amplify these interactions, or can accelerate these interactions, or how they can actually harm or stop or remove or slow them down. And then how do we reinterpret this idea of the single family home versus the single family versus the compound? And then we would come up with these sketches that would also explain sort of this policing of space that we talked about before as those who think that they have ownership of the public realm when we know that's not the case. These are all sort of larger infrastructural moments that we all should have access to. So I'm actually gonna stop it there because this thing is sort of weird. There was a whole thing that I had lined up because next week is the, um, it's the film festival here in New Orleans. And I made a movie, and the movie got accepted into the film festival. So I was actually going to screen the film for you all so you can see the five and a half minute film. But the computer doesn't want to work properly for us. So I think you might have to actually go in person on Monday to actually see the movie itself. But it's called You Can Always Come Home. And it talks about architectural space, specifically the porch as a means of the light of self-care and of hope. And so I wanted to end it with that. And it was all embedded into the previous presentation, but since we've now switched computers and stuff, sort of seems like it's a laborious process to get back to it. So I will unfortunately end it there because of the technical issues and I apologize for those technical issues. Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks for an amazing I think very provocative lecture, um, very timely uh, in its kind of presence here at the school and outside of here globally as well. Um, and there, I mean, there's a lot of things I find interesting about your work. I'm going to read this just okay. to make sure that I don't ramble, okay. but, but I want it to be conversational. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I know. <laughs> kind of duplicitous. Okay. So your work on the porch is very interesting to me, as my own research pertains to how the built parameters of the home are only one aspect of the space itself. But there are often these interstitial urban spaces outside of the home, such as the porch, the yard, the alley, and more, that become an extension of ourselves. There is something about the informality of the space of the porch that differentiates itself from the more formalized and private interior that defines the role, defines the role of the porch in our spatial uh, such as in Friday, the, the Oscar-winning film, Friday, everyone. Uh, just kidding, no one laughs, except for you. You're the audience for this. Um, the, the porch is essentially the setting for the whole movie. The entire thing takes place on the, on the porch. So can you speak to how the porch is a space of disruption within the built environment? Um, meaning it kind of breaks up the monotony of our everyday routine. It can't be programmed, it can't be, it can't be planned. Kind of an unplanned space. Can you speak to that? Well, I, I wouldn't say that it's a disruption of the public space. I would say the porch, in my opinion, at least, is community. And that's a cross culture. Um, I find that people that typically occupy their porch have a better connection with the other people in their neighborhood. I find they have a better connection with their neighbors because it becomes another form of collective. When you're sitting on your front porch, you're having conversations with people who walk along the street along the sidewalk. 
it's the it's the joint understanding that we are all a part of this larger urban or suburban ecosystem that we should be empowered to then help each other succeed in the system. So I know in my neighborhood back home in Chicago, we were sitting on the porch all summer, right? And that's something that my parents did in the And my mother always tells the story of her grandmother who would sit on the porch and wait on them to come home from school because that's just something she could do. And so when I drive around New Orleans and I see mom and the dad or the grandmother and the grandfather or the family sitting on the porch, you begin to understand this idea of family in this interstitial space. And I think the most important thing about the space is that it can be manipulated and so flexible. A porch can be a library, it can be a hair salon, it can be a place where you sell lemonade, it can be a place where you get therapy, it can be a place where you dance, where you play, right? All within this sort of extra, I mean, extra appendage that was ironically done more for climatic reasons, um, more so than actual infrastructure and cultural reasons, because if you trace it back to West Africa, the porch is where the men actually occupied when it was time to be a merchant. So if you were selling goods, you were on the porch and females were inside the house because you didn't want somebody coming by that could steal your wife, like physically pick her up, like run away and steal your wife. So taking that and then moving it all New Orleans, and then by way, Houston, Arkansas, Chicago, Cleveland, you're taking the same understanding of this space as a commonality between, say, me and Marcel right now, as a way of us have conversation and exchange goods or exchange intellect, or for me to say hello as he's walking his children or his family or his friends, like to where they need to go. Right? So I think it's less of a disruption and more so a way to stitch. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I'm still working through that disruption. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I guess I see it as like a kind of an other space, right? Whereas the interior is like this private world that where we can hide all of our kind of personal identity. The porch, and I think this is your back to your presentation. The porch is really the space of showing off. Mm -hmm. yeah, I find that that's what I find really interesting about it. Um, all right, so. So moving on, I think I think the, the issue of visual anteism is groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Um, well, one is the, the collection of people that gathered for that issue is really something I haven't seen like that caliber of people together before. So it's a it's a triumph. So congratulations. Thank you. Go pick it up at your local bookstore. Um, so you recently released the 33rd issue of Moss Context, which you guest edited, as you said, with Shining Blue Bud. I found your approach super interesting, namely the provocation of exploring the topic through those three manifestations of the role of the vigilante. Um, I like the framework because it reveals that kind of double-edged sword of, uh, and the question is like, what does it mean to be vigilant? So can you expand a little bit more about how the, the issue explored that inherent duplicity? And I know we, we spoke a little bit about, you know, Jane Jacobs and Eyes on the Street as, as you all know, so, I'd like to pick your brain about, about all of that. So first I'd like to say, um, the issue totally happened by accident. Totally by accident. Like I mentioned before, we were just having monthly Zoom calls, me and Shaheen just working through this as our own research. And sort of decided, I think we have something. And we pitched it to a editor. And when we pitched it to the editor, they told us to wait. And they said, just hold on for a second. We're finishing this other issue. We'll come back. And so we're being polite, and a month goes by, and two months go by, and three months go by. And we still don't have an answer from this editor of the publication. And so we pursue mass context and we say, hey, Eager Gill, we have this idea of an issue. We have these people. We would love to position this idea of vigilantism as a digital realm and movie space, what do you think? He said, absolutely. So then we went back to the original editor and we said, we understand you have a lot on your plate. We found someone else. You don't have to worry about it. All thought we were doing the right thing by telling them that very much. The editor responded with, that's unethical. 
you shouldn't do that. It's bad business. Why did you come to us if you're going to go to someone else? Like, I got yelled at via email. And so through this process, I'm like, I'm so glad we can't go with you. Now I understand it's a terrible thing. And so in pivoting this way, we have full creative control over the entire issue. And so what we learned is so many things that we see in the built environment are only half the story. There's always a position that we're always missing. And so how do you jump back and forth between personality and point avatar? And how does that shape your experiences with the so if we take the instance in Starbucks, where the two gentlemen were having, were having a business meeting, and someone called the police, and the police come, and they reprimand the two gentlemen and say, you need to leave. Even though many of us use Starbucks as an office, it's regular, right? You buy one thing that costs a dollar, you can be there for eight hours. And you think that's just normal instances, but the person that's holding the phone has so much power in that moment because they're the ones that get to determine how does this get disseminated. If you take it from one perspective, it can seem as though these gentlemen are doing something wrong. If you take it from another angle, they're the ones that's being caught. And so we we're trying to understand what about space makes people behave the way that they behave. And if you take this to, to say the institutional level of this room that we're in, the moment you create a space, you and I now have a certain hierarchy over this entire audience immediately. And then once you create this dynamic, behavior responds to it. So I get to interact at a different level than the audience does purely by raising us in that off the wall. And so how do we diagram that architecture? How do we understand it architecturally? How do we jump through these different, uh, these different sort of lenses to then talk about that? So the entire issue, which is like 300 pages with 15 different people in our interview, talk about this from multiple lenses, from immigration, from policy, from academia, uh, from sort of a larger research perspective, the one-to-one -one perspective, the Sam Mockby uh, instance I talked about before with um, went to the rural studio and this is a, a young lady that's from rural Alabama and she would drive convicts every single day to the job site to build a church that everybody in the community needs. Sort of a positive way of understanding the indigenous. Whereas another person talked about the suburban home and how the moment you erect the wall, which if you've ever been to South Florida, almost every single community is a gated community that nobody is allowed into. How are we restricting space that way also? But then positioning that against the people who create our culture of urban planning, like say it's James, Jason, et cetera, who are trying to get us to understand the city, or are only trying to get us to understand the city from one perspective. And we need to jump back and forth between these avatars to truly understand it. Yeah, I'm still I'm still trying to process the answer, but but I mean staying on the same kind of Line of thought. So you're saying, so you're saying Jane Jacobs is kind of problematic or problematizing the space, public space, let's say. But how how do we, as educators now, like how do we address these kinds of, of figures? Um, so in other words, how can we trouble the canon, let's say, without rewriting the history, but in a way that respects the contributions of potentially problematic figures, let's say. Um, while at the same time revealing their kind of So from a, from a personal perspective, I don't think we can abolish the space again. I think that's absurd. I think, I think removing the legacy of so many of these architects, urban planners, theorists, is in my opinion, just stupid. Uh, because it gives you some sort of framework. Now that doesn't mean that that's the only position to have and that that's the right but it's always good to be able and willing to listen to both sides of these positions. If you're very, if you're very focused and that you only allow one perspective, then I think that myopic sort of view is harmful to the pedagogy. I think it's harmful to architects. So for someone who may see Jane Jacobs as isolated, 
and then will then tell the students you can't read them. You're not helping that student, right? Like you're hurting that student by removing that district because it's so impactful to the architect. Now, if you want to counter that by saying, who was someone that may be marginalized, that may be queer, that may be a person of color, that may be differently able, that can then position against you. And I'm all for that. But then you have these, these counter narratives to compare to each other and then position yourself within that and you understand at your own pace. I've never believed it's a one or the other type of situation. The problematic people is only problematic to certain people. The unproblematic is only unproblematic to other people. And unless you're accepting of these multiple narratives, how do you really have an understanding of the larger progressive architect from antiquity to now? Yeah, I mean, I find that fascinating because it's sometimes the approach is let's replace one canon with another. Yeah. And then you're just kind of applying your own set of biases to this existing thing that's already there, and you don't understand the kind of complex network that's built in within that. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I think that's, I think I thought that was actually. I mean, when I, when I teach courses and stuff, I assign Jane Jacob, and I also assign like someone, um, someone like Rashad Shabbat, who wrote about speculating black, right? So I position them both against each other, not one or the other. Both of these texts are equally important. And I think they should own it. If I only subjected my students to Rashad Shabbat, I'm creating a brand new sense of biases based off of that perspective, only that. So I think that's unfair. This is someone who was trained by hand first for four years. So I'm of that generation where you don't use a computer and you do things a certain way, but then in graduate school, the exact opposite. Where so now reconciling these two approaches to architecture and moving forward from there. Uh, we should probably open it up to the audience pretty soon here. Do you have a, another question, Omar? Or? No, I think that's a good spot. I have Ready? Question. All right. <laughs> I'll run the mic around. So does anybody from the audience have questions? Come on. What's up, Nick? How you doing? I'm well, how are you? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your upcoming work for the Rome Prize and how you're turning your eye towards like the Italian and like how like that side of architecture is being like, influenced by the African diaspora. Sure. Um, so uh, I was fortunate enough to be awarded the Rome Prize for um, 21, um, And with that proposal, it was actually based off of my porch research. And again, I only know how to be honest with you all since the truth story. I finished the Grand Foundation Project. I was interviewed by the New York, New York Times. I finished that proposal. And then one of the faculty at the University of Miami he was into classical architecture, pulled me to the side, grabs me, Jermaine, I saw you in New York Times, amazing article, but it's wrong. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, Porches have been around way longer than this. You can go to Rome tomorrow and find tons of porches. They already exist. It's called the Port Club. So I look at him, I say, couldn't just leave that congratulations at the New York Times article, but we have to add the extra part to it after that. And it always stuck in the back of my mind of the portable. And so when the Rome Prize application came out, I was like, you know what? Let me try to trace this legacy even further. Because I went all the way back to West Africa, can I go back further than that? And I created to craft the sort of position of the Roman portico and me understanding its position in Rome and in how that has certain relatable qualities to the porch itself in the South, right? So moving around, but then also finding out what contributions did Northern Africa have to that legacy as well? Because one of the things that we know is that there was spatial occupation back and forth between Morocco, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Mauritania, all of these places have connection. There are literal port cities in Rome that were occupied by the Moors. Moors literally meaning Black. So if these histories and legacies exist, again, back to the early part of the lecture, why was I never taught these things? Why can't I go find them? So I proposed to the, the Rome committee 
let me run around Rome for five months and look up porticos and find people and understand this legacy and then bring it back to the US and then reimagine American neoclassical architecture. that way. And so that's the actual proposal. And then for some reason, I don't know why, Nick, I also told them I want to imagine a brand new column order. So I have to create a brand new column order too. I don't know why I said that, but now I have to create a brand new column order to be along the line of Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, Composite, whatever the hell Jermaine comes up with. <laughs> so that's the, that's the actual proposal. So when I go to Rome in February, I begin understanding that legacy to build on whatever that order may be. That's great. I can't wait to see how it turns out. Um, I feel like when you started the presentation, there was, I was like, oh no, you're missing a picture, like the Black Crescent. So I really yeah. it's great that, it, like, that's going to be another slide that's going to be added, like, like Ion exactly. and And this is like this new, like, looking back and seeing this, like, new Black all capital that's inspired by the experiences. And that's, and that's the ultimate goal. I mean, the, the awesome part is there's amazing other historians that have already done a lot of this work. And so I get to lean on the things that they've already created and the legacy that they've already began to, to forge, understanding this positioning of the diaspora within classical architecture. And so I'm not starting from scratch. Um, so that, that's amazing. And so to amplify the work of these individuals, but also finding my own new path, because I've done the porch already. I'm currently in the kitchen. And then now I'm trying to figure out sort of the structure that supports it all. That's next. Like I didn't show you any kitchen work, but I'm also like working on kitchen stuff now because I'm really interested in domestic space. Because to be totally frank with everyone, I care more about the things that happen within space than the actual like physical space itself. I find that's most interesting. I find the connection between people is super cool to learn about how people utilize space. Like, I want to know how the Albanian family uses their kitchen against how the Filipino family uses their kitchen against how the African-American family uses their kitchen. And what about that space engenders certain behavior? That's what I'm fascinated about. Not the fact that it might be a balloon frame structure that has certain class. Which, I mean, that's interesting, but it's not that interesting. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I had a question going back to the first slide of yours. It resonates a lot with me in the idea of marrying yourself in your work and what that, that really started your exploration and your research. Um, and I think it's probably relevant very much to the students as well in the idea of how you can bring a great importance to the work that you pursue by finding what really resonates with your identity. I, I also believe, and this is my experience, is it also brings more vulnerability to, to the work that you do. Um, and I'm very curious, and I'd like to hear your perspective on as you proceeded in your work and your career and passed your thesis, that vulnerability and that identity that you had at the beginning, is that still so much the case? And have you found challenges in that in your career at, at this point? Yeah, so um, for those of you who may not have heard the question, just the process that I found within my thesis proposal and the vulnerability to create that project is still remaining as I practice today. And I would say yes. And the reason why I say yes is because, as I mentioned before, I think architecture has the power to tell stories. If you go through the bayou and you see the water levels or remnants of water levels on one of the posts, you're understanding the legacy of how water was up and down. Right? So that building is a marker of the heritage of that site. And what I found is the work that I do in the communities that I do it, they don't speak our language. So when we talk architecture, it's complete jargon to those individuals. And those individuals are people like my grandparents or my cousins or <laughs> friends from home. And so my goal has always been, how can I make this relatable to you without dumbing it down? Because that's the key, right? It's this, it's this acknowledgement that I don't have to treat you as though you're stupid. I just have to treat you as though you're different. And then once I figure that out, I can then bridge that gap architecturally. And then now we can speak on equal footing. 
but it takes a lot of humbling in order to do that because we're trained in this environment. We have so much knowledge that it's hard to sort of stop and, and remove the 13 letter words that we love putting in papers and essays and stuff and just have regular conversations with people. And then when we have regular conversations, they really begin to understand the practice and understand what we're building. And then once you have that understanding, it makes it easier to do the work. So when I was working through my thesis, I had a hard time finding that. And I was trying to reconcile urban scale development with social housing, with ethnicity and race, which as a 24 year old, like an absurd task to take on. But I felt like I had to do it because I had to prove that professor wrong. And then I've always kept that ethos in my mind of, I can make you understand. And it becomes this sort of battle that I like to call high res and low res. High res being a building like this, that's a very beautiful structure inside and outside that people immediately understand. But like they made an Oblaka proposal, which is just a park at one point, how do I get high design to also value that the fact that it's just the park? Because to the people who utilize the park, it's more than just the park. And that's where that vulnerability comes in. People can understand that. Okay, I'll remove my ego to this proposal because this is what is necessary, what is needed. And then perhaps I can find a way to elevate this to a level that more people can appreciate as well. Yeah, so I was actually going to ask you more so about. So it's, 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 it's tough. And I say that because COVID has obviously restricted our mobility. You can't just go a lot of places. So you can't have a full understanding of normalcy because the world isn't the way that we used to know it was normal. It's a different type of thing. Um, but that said, technology shrinks the world so much that many of the things that you want to find at a user level, you just got to Google it. Or you have to go on the social media apps that you utilize eight hours out of the day and just geotag Kansas City, right? And see what's happening in Kansas City, which is something we couldn't do. Like if I want to go on Kansas City, I had to like map quest things or try to find this stuff out. But like you all can actually do that now. And when you do that and you're able to shrink the world a bit more, you have a bit more wherewithal to understand what's happening at, at a one-to-one -one scale. And then above all, I don't know how many of you students actually do this, but like our professors made us do it. Pick up a book. Like, pick up a book and read. And when you pick up a book and read, you will also learn things. And you will learn different things because it's not regurgitated information. It's like the first source. Like, how many of you know the difference between the primary, the secondary, the tertiary source? But these are the things that actually help you design things because you have a reference for them, you have a historical reference. Um, as opposed to, let's say, personal anecdotes, which can be hit or miss depending on the project. But I also think the one-to-one -one interview is such an important aspect of architecture. That one-to-one -one interaction, not only with the client, but with the user, and understanding those oral histories is so important when you're doing architecture, like one-to-one -one scale, urban scale. Because I always like to tell people, my grandmother doesn't know anything about architecture. Zero. She just knows her grandbaby does it. That's all she knows. But if you put her in the kitchen, she knows counter dimensions. She knows proximities, adjacencies better than a 20 year license art. Because she utilizes that space. She can tell you immediately that's not going to fit on the counter. And then when you're trying to make it work, she's like, I told you it wasn't going to fit on the counter. Or she's going to say, that door, when it swings open, is going to smack against the other thing. And that's not a trained architect, but that's someone that understands space. And that active space is something that helps you design that. You just have to value those conversations because oftentimes if they don't also have an architecture, we don't value those conversations. 
but they're the ones that use the space and they know it so much better than we do. So I stopped challenging my grandmother on kitchen design. You know, it's like, you know this better than me. Give me like some more years and we'll have this conversation again. She's like still around. But to me, that's how that's how we do it. So. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jermaine Lamar, for that good conversation. Uh, I'm still learning how to not be an awkward in person. So, <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. Thank for you. A wonderful lecture. Thank you. And Omar, thank you for a great discussion. Uh, and with that, we will close our first in person lecture for the fall semester. So, thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.